talk to you about uh, a library that I written two years ago uh, about <coughs> Unicode, which is called Ghost uh, Unicode. And um, to uh, implement Unicode facilities, I designed a system to deal with uh, conversion and segmentation of arbitrary vendors. Uh, just a little joke here, uh, probably used to this if you uh, dealt a bit with UTF-8, sometimes uh, uh, text appears a bit uh, like this. So, for instance, when you um, uh, read UTF-8 as Latin 1. So, this, uh, the code is available on the, on the sandbox. Um, uh, so the documentation is also available on the internet, uh, matthias.gov.com slash unicode. So uh, what I want to, what I really need for this library to be ready for review is feedback, because I haven't had, got much feedback uh, when I uh, talked about it on the mailing list. This is really the, the main reason why uh, I think it hasn't been uh, submitted for review yet. So first, uh, Let's talk a bit about what Unicode is. Uh, a lot of people already think Unicode is a UTF-8, UTF-16, but it's more than that. It's basically a character set that takes all the characters from all languages and it's about one million entries. So you, you can't just uh, put all characters into a 16-bit uh, uh, integer. You have to uh, use a 32-bit integer or those encodings we'll see later. And, uh, <laughs> What the correct set contains is called code, code points. The, the, the entry in the, in the set. Each code point has all the information associated to it. Uh, what kind of what kind of character is, is the letter? It's a, a number. It doesn't have certain properties. Um, it can also be decomposed. It's a letter about decompositions. Um, well, what we can call decomposition, but it's also uh, compatible to decomposition. So, for example, there's a character which is uh, one on four and you can decompose it into one slash four uh, as one of the decompositions value. And uh, each character can be uh, set to uppercase, lowercase, title case, and there's also case holding, which is different to, uh, than the other ones, because it doesn't mean anything for our language purposes. Uh, for example, the lowercase, uh, lowercase and uppercase version of uh, the sigma character in Greek is different depending on the position of the character in the word. The case folding doesn't really care about that. It's just, it's just something you should use if you want to do case-less comparison. Uh, so, as I said, uh, I have decompositions, and um, we can compose characters by combining them. Uh, the mechanism to combine characters is you have one ba ba base character followed by the number of uh, combining characters, and it is defined in single combining character sequence. So that's lots of the algorithm within Unicode to deal with these sequences. And then uh, you have another um, distinction, which is a grapheme. The grapheme is really the real character uh, instruction. It's the, the character as you, the user will see it. And so uh, Unicode provides uh, algorithm to do dealing with these graphemes, that's the word sentences. Um, about words, you, it's not always possible uh, it's the languages to distinguish different words. Uh, so uh, Unicode does best effort and it uh, advises implementation to use dictionaries if you want to do uh, real uh, world limitation. Because in languages like Japanese or Thai, uh, there's no clear distinction between words, no, no word space. And then finally, there are uh, algorithms for uh, comparison and sorting. Uh, also, it's different types of sorting and uh, sorting for notebooks, uh, for uh, phone books. And, the simple one is the most popular things about Unicode, the UTF, the UTF encodings. So as 21 bit uh, is not really practical, uh, you can encode it uh, into three different forms. Uh, there are more forms available, but this one this one sounds the most popular. Uh, so uh, UTF, UTF, UTF X means that uh, you're going to encode on X uh, on units of X bits each. And so for UTF-8, uh, you're going to have one to four uh, code units. It's called a code unit, uh, it's the, uh, the, the unit to which you encode. But one code point becomes one to four code units, or one to two uh, code units in UTF-16. UTF 
and the UTF-X thirty two is of course a uh, non-variable width. So the variable width is something that makes dealing with Unicode very different uh, from the character sets because um, you cannot just use random access as you would normally do. Uh, so about combining character sequences. So as I said, you can have one baseline character followed by any number of combining characters. Um, there's no R limit on that number, but uh, uh, you, Unicode allows you to set a limit of uh, 32 if you really want to do something uh, that re requires a uh, fixed buffer. Uh, this is something that I do in this Unicode. And uh, of course, you can have many different representations for the same, for the same character because you can combine the components, the combining character, the combining components in different orders. So as a point, there is a canonical ordering, and you've got uh, uh, normalization forms, which are fully decomposed, or fully, uh, fully, com uh, fully decomposed and recomposed. That's NFC. So the second example, so I had to use, I actually had to use an image here for this character because uh, LaTeX wouldn't let me put it. Put it. So there's different ways to represent it. Uh, the fully pre-composed way, uh, one which is half pre-composed because we still have here with the dot below, but we add a combining second flex cut point, and then the fully decomposed version, which is E followed by combining dot below, uh, followed by combining second flex. And you also have the same, um, this, this is this, and this is the same, except the combining uh, characters are not in the same order. This is equivalent, but this is not uh, canonically ordered. So is, is there a defined canonical ordering? What is that? Yes, it's defined, uh, it's, uh, defined according to some property of the code point. Combining class is called. You, you sort, you actually do a bubble sort. On, uh, on the combining character sequence using the, uh, the combining class. So we've seen the different ways to see a character, uh, the code unit, which is a basic uh, encoding, basic signature encoding in UTF, the code points, which is uh, the entry in the Unicode uh, character set, the combining character sequence, and the graphing cluster, which is the abstract character abstraction. So this is really different from coming character sequences. Uh, so what's a character is really uh, up to you. Um, you can choose to depends what level of granularity you need. Uh, sometimes you just want to work at the code unit level or the code point level. Sometimes you want to work at the graphic level. So the my library allows you to do all that. So what do we need for Unicode's library? But first, we need to set up the table that contains all the uh, properties for each code point. So this is going to be pretty large because you've got one million code points and each has uh, maybe, I don't remember, maybe 20 properties. And um, this data is different depending on uh, different locales. Uh, some properties can be considered to be different depending on which language you're going to be de dealing with. Uh, so that's why I think we need to have uh, dynamically linked libraries so that we can change uh, the library by one more tailored to a particular you know, use. And um, since uh, we have a library, so it needs to be at least backward from that. This is really just uh, give me a code point, I give you uh, the, give me a code point in the property you want, and give you the value for the property. Uh, this is very low level. Uh, this is used for, for uh, lookup dat database purposes. Uh, it's not really the features we want for the users. Uh, so there is um, an implementation of the library as part of the Goose Unicode library. Um, it's based on some work done by someone before, uh, I don't remember his name, but unfortunately. But uh, something I inherited from the Goose vote. It uses a spirit classic parser, so basically it gets all the information is available on the Unicode website, uh, and you can parse it and do whatever you want with it. So uh, there's a parser that generates uh, the tables uh, to be used at the library uh, to remove redundancy. I use a two-level memory structure. Um, it's also forward compatible uh, because I check um, on the either side. I check that the property returned by the binary library uh, matches uh, values that we know 
and if it's not by the window, we can uh, fall back to unknown. And for composition, this is a bit complicated uh, because I need to uh, take a decomposed uh, string and find the uh, ways to, uh, compose it, to compose it. So I need to expose prefix and suffix trees. Suffix is just for if you want to iterate right to left. Uh, so I need to come up with a better IBI, I think, to expose this because it's not uh, very good at the moment, but it works. So uh, what we really need for Unicode, the thing with Unicode, I think, is that we can you know, two, basically two categories of uh, things that we're going to do with text. We're going to want to convert text, transform it, and uh, transcode it between character sets, uh, do normalization, uh, transform case, and segmentation, so we want to be able to iterate through the code points of a uh, range, through, the, uh, through the, character, the characters, uh, different types of characters, the words, and all that. Uh, we want to be able to, from a random position in string, find where is the closest, um, the closest word, the closest boundary of a word, the closest boundary of a code point, and to be able to sync for substrings uh, in a bigger string, for, uh, for matching, for passing, for passing. You know. And yeah, and normalization is of course not stable by concatenation uh, because uh, if your string on the right starts with a combining character, you might have to uh, renormalize uh, the bit in the middle. Uh, so, if we want to do all that, maybe it's the solution having yet another, uh, st yet another string type. That's a popular solution that comes up often on the boost mailing list. I don't think this is a good solution. I think uh, it should be more cent centered on the algorithms themselves uh, rather than the data. So um, I want the algorithm to be able to work <coughs> with the string type uh, wherever it is stored. Um, I have no problem with memory allocation, so uh, do as little memory allocation as possible when we need to be able to control it. I want to be able to combine the different types of transformation. Um, I want it to be fast, of course. There's no use in something that's slow. Uh, there's always some use, but you can't reuse it. And what I also want to um, avoid duplication. I want to be able to define something once and be able to reuse it for many things. Uh, and it should be easy to use. So there are many qualities called something like this. Uh, I hope I've uh, come up with design that satisfies them. Uh, so uh, this is range based. I explained later what the range is. Um, I will need to write. Uh, Primitive wants, and I can reuse it, combine it uh, with different mechanisms. Um, I could do eager or lazy evaluation, that's the more that. Uh, and then we talk a bit about um, um, how it can be written with SIMD, but I'm also doing an SIMD talk tomorrow, so um, I'll give more detail about that tomorrow if you're interested in that. So a range is basically any type from which you can extract a uh, begin and the past iterator. And like iterators, can be refined. Uh, you've got a hierarchy of concepts. Uh, uh, a container is a range, a pair is a range. There's also an iterator range class, which is just a glorified pair. Um, it's quite practical, more practical than iterators, because you only have one object. You don't have to say begin and every time you want to use something. So this gives Terso syntax. You can use it with boost for each or the C++ explore loop. And so boost range is the library that provides um, most of the tools you need to deal with ranges. Um, so that's have some pretty cool range adapt adapters <coughs> us, which we added to quite recently. So this looks, uh, adapters which look a bit like this. Um, as input, uh, we've got a vector. So I got it wrong here, it's not R, it's B. Um, and so you have a, so this vector is a range. And we're going to build a new range, which is this range filtered by predicate P. Is a function p and f are functions of type uh, p and f. Um, so we're going to build a range which is filtered by p and transformed by f. So that means that the range here is um, this is b, but as we iterate it, we're going to remove all the elements that do not satisfy p, and then we're going to apply f on the result. So this gives us a mechanism for lazy evaluation of transformation on ranges. But unfortunately, transform is only element-wise. Uh, transformation just apply transformation on an element. Of course, yeah, you can see that the type of the range is quite complicated. So probably you don't want to write it. Uh, so 
like it's the same thing that when you use um, proto or DSLs, you have a long expression that's quite complicated. So I recommend that you don't uh, write it, write, write it out. You use auto if you can, uh, or don't make the variable, keep it temporary. So yeah, as I said, um, we're going to define a mechanism for uh, doing transformation for Unicode, for example, uh, uh, UTF-8 to UTF-32 uh, conversion. That can be done as well, uh, lastly, in this way. So to do this, I'm introducing a few concepts. Uh, this is a converted concept. This is the main concept uh, for this library. This basically models a step of a conversion. So because what we're going to do is we're going to try to, iter uh, to apply a conversion step by step, step by step, with an iterator adapter. So what it does is that it works for bidirectional ranges. So in here, in here is uh, in and out. Are iterators. This is a bidirectional input, uh, bidirectional iterator. This is an output iterator. And so, left to right and right to left um, will consume some of the input string, input uh, range, which is defined by begin and end, and will write some input on to to out and to return. Um, and so, it's uh, when it does that. For example, left to right, it will consume some of the some of the range. And the advanced begins once it's not constantly going to be modified. And then you can check uh, that it, does, it doesn't reach the end, for example, with end. And the other way around, we do right to left to modify end and write something to, to opt. So um, the input, there is a few uh, type that are used for generating the, the right um, iterator adapters. Uh, the input type is only used for concept checking, so if you disable concept checking, you don't need it. It's not archetype, it's basically a type that satisfy uh, all the requirements for your uh, functions. So this is the type, uh, value type of the in, in iterator. The output type, what kind of output you need to put in and uh, out. Uh, max output, how many elements you're going to write to the output, and, and maximum. This is optional, if you do not specify that, it will be uh, heap located. And the alignment, which is just, uh, it says, all the, uh, the output buffer should be aligned if you need to do, for example, assigning this stuff. Um, so it does look basically I've defined a converter which is called U U8 decoder so as you might think U8 decoder does UTF-8 to U UTF-32 conversion um, so this is, I use the convert function but I also have um, committee functions that send directly decode uh, UTF-8 U8. there is a U8 decoder container. so for example you have your, your output as UTF-8 as a string for example but you can have a a sort of string literal, you could have uh, an array, you could have uh, a vector or anything you want. And we're going to want to write it to uh, this buffer, which is a passing string of CAR32, because uh, the library defines uh, two types. CAR32 is one of them, uh, which is like CAR32 T from T plus X, but it is also compatible with T plus OS3. So, what we do, we pass to convert the input data the converter, and then the output iterator. The output iterator does a pushback on uh, this range. So what this do is going to eagerly convert this line, will copy into UTF-32 UTF data uh, the converted form of UTF-8 <laughs> data. And then you can iterate it, for example, with this branch. This branch. Uh, so you get each code point. You can do the same thing lastly. Uh, which is quite shorter, doesn't require you to allocate any additional memory, but it can be a bit slower, and you don't have as much control about when things get evaluated. So the syntax for this is use the convert version for uh, adapters, the lazy version, give the string as input, uh, yes, be you use UTF-8 data and string, and uh, the decoder. And this will return you a string, uh, range, which will, as you iterate it, generate you the KLCD2 code point, uh, that you can use and you can then print like this. Uh, if you don't want to do your evaluation without pushback, uh, you can also do it in two passes. First, you count how many characters you need to have. <laughs> so uh, here I'm using the counting iterator. This is an iterator from Boost Iterator, which will simply count how many times it has been uh, implemented. So first, we run it with the counting iterator. So then, IT base gives us a uh, size t corresponds to many times it has been implemented. So we can allocate we can allocate the data here, and then we just have to uh, directly 
here compared to that lab. And we don't need to do pushback. We directly uh, write it into the vector. Uh, there's something quite similar, which is a segment of concepts. It's basically like a converter, but it doesn't have output. And it also has a type. So this is used for segment, uh, segmentation. So when you want to iterate over queries, over graphemes, or over code points, but not convert them. So what does it look like? Uh, so uh, you're going to use the UX segmenter, which is uh, it segments a string or a UTF-8 string uh, with code points. So you get uh, two of the code points, but you keep them in UTF-8 uh, uh, representation. You don't uh, convert them. This is quite faster than converting them. And so you get a sub range. So this is you get a range of ranges when you do that. And each sub range is the code point. So the type of the sub range is iterator range, so iterative iterate type, type of the input. Uh, so again, if you had if you the good for each auto, you could, you could avoid having to put this. Uh, so this is a segment function, uh, that's a segment function. Uh, and so you, we do uh, first, first, uh, first for each loop, and then we iterate each car within uh, the sub range. So we print the code points, but as a list of the uh, code units to contain it. And there's a boundary checker concept, which is here to, uh, that's the last concept uh, we will introduce. Uh, it's just a concept that tells you whether a position opposed within the range picking end uh, lies with, on the particular boundary. So, for example, if you have a graphing boundary, uh, this you have a graphing uh, graphing boundary uh, model boundary checker, which will tell you uh, whether a position is on the graphing boundary or if it is in the middle of the graphing. This is quite useful if you want to do, you have a random position and you want to find uh, the next one. So of course, uh, so all those concepts are quite related. Uh, I can define, I can combine them, I can uh, build new things. There's a multi-boundary, uh, first uh, builds a boundary checker, that's a test for first boundary, applies a converter, that's one of the boundary. Uh, I can make, make a segment from a converter simply by discarding the output, uh, the output, not the input, sorry. Uh, I can build a segmenter from boundary checker but, uh, simply by uh, advancing until the, the boundary is found. Uh, and then I can uh, I can apply the segmenter before a converter. Uh, don't you you have to remember which... I, I've used all of these to combine and create new ones. I'm, I'm going to demonstrate afterwards. Uh, the multi-converter does first apply the converter then uh, tries to apply a second converter on the output it has got. Uh, so this, must, this one, must, uh, the steps must well combine because uh, the output of the one step is used for the input of the second step. Uh, the other one is, works the other way around, but only works if the first converter has a max output of one. I also have a way to define uh, the converter concept of define, uh, that is uh, defined using a code conversion facet, which is um, uh, uh, standard facility. I use this when I want to do, um, generate converters from my the local local system. Okay, so you have uh, three ways of using converters. Uh, you can you can also define a code conversion facet. I don't really, I really don't recommend doing that because code conversion facets are uh, terrible. They're uh, very uh, slow, not hard, not easy to use. We've got a lot of cuts. Um, you can do uh, an iterator adapter or range adapter. Uh, that would apply the conversion step by step. It's quite practical because you don't have to really think about where I'm going to store the data or where I'm going to allocate uh, the memory. Uh, or you can evaluate it in title, which is the fastest thing you can do, uh, but uh, is a bit more involved. Uh, first, I want to say something about uh, the segmentation. Uh, maybe I'll go back here. Um, recently, a new library has been accepted to boost, which is called Boost Locale. Uh, the way it does segmentation is that instead of returning a sub range, it's going to return you uh, a new STD string. So every time you iterate through a particular substring, you're going to have to copy the data. So, uh, everything I did, I was careful to not do any copy, any memory allocation that was not needed. Uh, 
answer that. So everything is defined in terms of uh, these batting primitives. I've got a cast converter that just casts as you put to a different type. Uh, UTF-8 uh, decoder encoder, uh, same thing for uh, UTF-16. Uh, and uh, the boundary checker for UTF-8. Uh, you've got the local UTF transcoder which is built in the code conversion basis. It's UTF because it returns uh, W car T which is not necessary, we don't know what it is, it is yes, either UTF-16 or UTF-32 depending on the implementation. Because the combining boundary that tells you whether you want a combining sequence boundary, uh, the graphene boundary tells you whether you want a graphene class of boundary. And the decomposer and composer. <coughs> so the decomposition, uh, decomposition simply calls uh, the, de the decomposition property and needs to recursively uh, decompose everything, then canonically uh, so solve them. And the composer does uh, something different. Uh, it's when you, if you want to, it really only works if you have already a fully decomposed uh, string. If you recompose it, you recompose, recompose it using uh, trees uh, of the strings, uh, trees. Uh, that contain all the uh, two different post forms and then match, map them to the composed forms. So uh, from this I can define a lot of things. Um, there's UT, UTF decoder, which will cause a matching UA decoder or U16 decoder, depending on the size of uh, the input range. The encoder does the same thing, but that cannot deduce it by itself. You need to provide uh, some argument. The transcoder does uh, decode some UTF, e UTF X and it puts some UTF uh, Y. So you just have to define when you want to transcode from and to. Uh, but Latin one encoder, which is basically just a cast, because um, uh, Latin one is um, uh, it, this Latin was fully compatible with the Unicode Unicode character set, except well, when you are in UTF 32. But when you are when you are in UTF 8, you have to re-encode it uh, because uh, the characters are this uh, 8 bit of UTF 8 is different. Local decoder just uh, composes uh, the transcoder as before. And then when the normalizer calls decomposition then composition. So I got back here variance of the various uh, segmentation and boundaries. So you have two ways to segment uh, UTF-8. Uh, you can use the converter and discard, um, simply discard the output. Or you can use a boundary and simply advance it, which is much faster. Uh, then the combination with the combining boundary, the graphene boundary. Uh, the, the segment versions are segmentous. Uh, and you got also the normal normalization that directly takes the UTF-8 string, uh, normalizes it, and uh, converts it back to UTF-8. Uh, when we want to search with a string, uh, there are two ways to do it. You can either fully decode a string and uh, perform the search algorithm on your decoded string. That works. Uh, this way you can reuse uh, generic, uh, generic search algorithms. But this is usually not very fast because you spend a lot of time decoding uh, and searching. What you can do is that it works with most uh, encodings, especially UTF-8, which have very nice properties. Um, you can simply work on the code unit level. And uh, the matches that you found, you find. You set those that do not lie on the right boundaries, you can just discount. So we'll see more about that with an example. The second solution is faster. Um, because usually you don't have many position matches in the, the string you're going to look for. So this is an example uh, when I'm going to search for the string foo inside the input string foo. This is some combining character and foo. So normally I'm going to work at the graphene level. So this is foo followed by a combining character. I don't remember which one it is. I think it's this a uh, combining um, a circum circumflex. So this, this, this O is actually the O circumflex. 
So we don't want uh, to match this, and we don't want this to to, match, to be a match in our search. We, ju we just want to find the second one. Uh, so what you can do is uh, use uh, the find first algorithm from the string algo, which is um, find the first match uh, for a particular uh, search. So we will, we will provide decoded. Uh, the, the, the decoded, uh, no, we don't even need to decode it, just segmented version. Uh, the segmented, uh, we adapt it into a range of ranges, with the sub-ranges being, each being a grapheme. And since sub-ranges are already add comparison operators, to the work you will be able to compare and uh, check if it is the same, it's the same strings. Uh, so we need to adapt this. Uh, the, the type you get there will be very complicated because it will be a sub-range of this range, but this is uh, it will, it will match <coughs> the second. It will correspond to the second. The second way you can do this is um, you can adapt the finder. So in Boost String Algo, you've got this concept of finder, which is uh, all algorithm are actually defined with. Uh, so you, you could actually have this first, there's a first finder, but that's because you, it could be extended to add uh, a Knut Morris Pratt finder, because this is just as a naive. Uh, uh, finding and, and to finding. So we just need to adapt the finder with a boundary. So say we will build a new finder, but which will discard all matches that do not lie of this one. And if you do that, you can just do uh, find pass the finder, and you will get the iterator range directly on the original uh, the iterator type of the original input. It will be much faster to do it this way. So, uh, what does UTF-8 decoding look like? Uh, this is the algorithm I would do this. I do not uh, guarantee that this is the best way to do this. I just, I just did it two years ago, um, looking at the definition on Wikipedia, basically. Uh, so, what we'll see is that we're going to uh, consume uh, one, two, three, or four uh, different elements of input. So in, in reality, with the converter, it's not a return, it's right to it, but I, I wrote it as a return, so that it fits on the slides. Um, so we're going to cast it to 32 bits, depending on... So the first byte ta tells us which case we are, whether it's one character, two characters, three or four. Uh, and then we can build uh, the uh, code point simply by doing some bit shifting between the different bytes. Um, so well, I'm really wondering if whether this algorithm is vectorizable. Uh, the answer is not really, because as you can see, uh, you've got a lot of the big problems. It's variable width. You, re you read one or four, and for everything you're going to do vectorized, you need to have a fixed input, fixed output. Um, there's an other problems you've got branches. Uh, you've got promotion because uh, SIMD reduces fixed width, so uh, when you promote, you're going to have to split to several registers. So it's not really something that's very easy to vectorize. Uh, nevertheless, since I also work on the same delivery, uh, I wanted to be able to vectorize it. So the three problems are uh, promotion, branching, and data to consume the step variable width, and the data is interleaved. You don't have uh, all the first characters, all the second characters you have the first, second, and that. So we could define uh, within, the, within the system a new decoder which is going to be a U8 fast decoder, um, but which will instead the U8 decoder and the normal decoder, it reads uh, one to eight, uh, uh, one to four uh, bytes and write one one code point. Uh, if we were to write a fast decoder, so it will, it will have to uh, put four, four code points because we would do it in parallel. And uh, that's it, we don't have any data. We will we will need uh, to have a fixed input. So we need to do part of the work in Scala to first have pad it to have um, to pad it with zeros so as to have a fixed size of input. And and we'll also need to transpose it. So I won't get into too much detail about this uh, because uh, I, uh, this 
this is a few co concept from the SIMD talk, so I don't think this is uh, this is understandable uh, without explaining everything. Uh, but this part, this is the final uh, thing you can do. Um, basically, it's exactly the same code, except we've removed uh, the branching, we've replaced it with the select, which is basically the same thing, but it will evaluate all branches. So when you decode UTF-8, usually you only in the first case when you only have um, bytes. So if you evaluate all cases, all branches, this is not going to be very fast. So it's really a trade-off. Uh, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, what you could we could do is detect uh, which case we, we are if we are in if all the because we're going to decode four four code points at the same time. We could decode this all four, four, four code points are in the same case, and in that case, uh, use uh, an optimized algorithm. Uh, but uh, and branch with a real branch, uh, and we'll, we could get at a maximum uh, a four times speed up. Uh, but I uh, I haven't really benched this uh, still because I'm still working on this. I need to find whether the best option to do. Uh, it needs a lot of fine tuning depending on what kind of input you expect. And as we did here, uh, a lot of people do this. I've seen in other implementations. Uh, instead of doing a simple if, they put a likely uh, specifier that you can use for uh, instead of compilers uh, that allows you to say this, is, this branch is very likely, uh, prefer it over other branches. So uh, since text, you can assume that most text contains mostly ASCII, so you could decide that this is more likely and you could use it to speed it up. Okay, and this is actually all I've got. Um, how much time have I used? Not much, I suppose. You've got uh, 45 minutes left. <laughs> okay, so absolutely. Uh, so has any everyone on this well on the screen? Do you have questions maybe? I am. The the impression I formed was that you attack the, the whole Unicode problem. Mm -hmm. And that's really good, I mean, because one of the problems with other proposals I've seen is that there were always cases where somebody said, I want this or that or the other thing, mm -hmm. which it was possible but a library just concentrated on certain use cases, essentially. And so you, I, I think, it sounds like you can compose the components yeah. you've got to deal with. Yeah, that was the idea. Building the components separately, just have to write them once, and you can compose them to do whatever you want. It's really algorithm-centric, so you, the algorithm are there. There's no, nothing forcing you to use them, so you can, you can use whatever you want. If you just want to work at the code unit level, you can just do that. You, you pick what you want, basically, it's the idea of the library. The, um, so, the use case, like, here's a, say I decide to set myself up as a Unicode consultant. Yeah. And I have no idea, I want to be able, what problems I'm going to run into. Uh, and if anyone comes to me, I want to be able to solve their problem. I want your library and I want it bad because I can probably attack any, any problem. Uh, I'm worried what, where, where I, I'm not, the use cases I'm not seeing are somebody who wants to do one or two extremely simplistic things. Mm -hmm. uh, Often just simply involving conversion is probably about. Yeah, so the most interesting thing you want to do is conversion, convert between UTF yeah. encodings and that's it. And, and, maybe, and, and, and maybe do some things like uh, compares that are, you know, with some, a little bit of control over them, case sensitive versus case insensitive, or that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, I forgot to say that you obviously need to normalize the strings if you want to compare them correctly. 
Yeah, they're, they're okay, but if you want to the, as a the, the user of. who has that very limited problems doesn't want the fact that the library can solve a whole other set of problems for that particular use case if all you give them is the ability to compose a solution that's not a good that's not good for that user they want a pre-composed solution essentially and I mm -hmm. I'm not I, I haven't got any <clears throat> sense yet whether you will in fact provide that or that that's another level of higher level of abstraction that would have to be provided by an additional library. Do, do you understand why I'm, I'm, where I'm coming from, the use case thing, the different use, simple use so, cases? So you think something, you think something like that is not uh, easy enough to use? It's, you're getting, I mean, I, you know, you, you're getting there. You're pretty damn close, let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, so suppose, I think you kind of like touched on this at one point, but like suppose I have a string of Japanese characters and I yeah. want to break it into words. Um, you talked about using a dictionary. Well, and yeah, I, at the moment, the library doesn't support uh, words. No, we, I don't, don't support it, but like I could implement it uh, using the, uh, the properties defined by Unicode. But the, the basic Unicode character database doesn't do, it just does the best it for saying. Uh, for Japanese, you really need a dictionary. So uh, it won't be able to give you as, as good results as ICU, for example, which use, uses uh, uh, dictionaries. Yeah, so like, can I, is there a play, like I'm, I'm not, I don't know how, how do I hook in my diction? Like I bring my dictionary and how do I hook my algorithm? Well, you have to define, the uh, best way for it to define either a boundary checker or a segmenter, a new segmenter, and you can just use it to apply it to generate, you know, to uh, convert your range to range of ranges. Okay. Yes? Um, so just to, just to press Beeman's point a little bit further, I think, um, the obvious, maybe naive, but the obvious interface for doing the eager evaluation conversion would be an implicit conversion between UTF-8 strings mm -hmm. and UTF-32 strings. Yeah. And this is a this is a long way from that easy. Yeah, I decided, to, decided, a lot to, of I decided to, to, to take a new put iterator instead of returning the, uh, the range so that people have control of all the memories allocated. But maybe I, I need both. I think it's a I think it's a beautiful thing to have. You know, it, it's like the question of uh, are you just providing a basic toolkit or are you gonna give everything give people everything they need to operate conveniently whether even if they don't care about efficiency all the time. And a lot of people doing string manipulation are not caring that much about efficiency when they're doing it. Because mm -hmm. their the bottom links are elsewhere. Okay, well I, I think you probably need to uh, to put it together, but I don't know which way which way it should be put together because every time you want to make a new string type it just turns into a batch of discussions. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I I agree. Um, so that's why I decided to focus on the algorithms, uh, completely abstract myself from data and continuous, so that I don't run into any of these uh, controversies. Uh, but I think I, I think I have an idea about how you could approach that, and I'll talk to you about but, it after. So. But if you use basically the lazy version, you don't need to pass an input iterator. So it's as if you add a, a function that's uh, returned in your string. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> I am one of those users that Dean was talking about. I want to take UTF-8 string and get graphemes from it, and that's all I want. And if that uh, function right there had a, had a convenience function on top of it that basically called that implementation, but uh, the interface to it was, I take a const char star, and the name of it is something like convert to UTF-8. It takes a const char star and I give it a, a, a UCS32 mm -hmm. string, right, of my own of devising. Mm -hmm. Um, that I just pass. If I just pass it those two parameters, that would be exactly what I needed. I think that kind of thing on top of this layer, I mean, this is great work. Yeah, but, but a string iterator is, is already a range, so it would work. Say that again? So a string iterator is already a range, I think, so it, it should work. A string what is already a range? Iterator is already a range. Iterator. range. Okay. A string iterator by itself is a range? No. A string no. literal? No, no. Literal. 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 Oh, literal. literal. oh uh, a string literal. I think that that may have been changed. Um, but the problem is that you, you got may have the new character at the end. Yeah, I, th I hope that it was changed uh, because 
because the problem with that is you can't distinguish a scan literal from a, from a character pointer. I guess if you if well, you get it as an array, then right, you're okay. Yeah, get it by right. I might just be array. If yeah. you get it as an array, then you're okay. Is that what they do? Uh, mm -hmm. I assume. All right. But um, so I have got basically I've got the convert function, adapters convert, um, and segment function, and I also define for each segmenter, I've got a U8 segment, uh, U8 convert. So I've got a lot of boilerplate functions that maybe try to make it easier to use, but I don't know if it's really that useful. This may be naive. What does it take to tie this to, say, boost regex? Um, I don't really remember how boost regex works. I think it works on a string type. No? That's the one now? I, I think you can choose the character type. And, and so you could work on I Both think points, ex I expressive works with iterate iterators, uh, while regex yeah. works with uh, strings or by basic R of uh, T. So it might be easier to use with expressive. Mm -hmm. um, can we go back to the slide you had a moment ago? Um, this one? Yeah. So two questions. First of all, if I wanted to convert to um, QCS, 16 rather than 32, can I do that? Yeah, you would use uh, the UTF transcoder and you would pipe the UTF transcoder and you want to, what do you want? To, to 16 bit instead of 32. So you would write uh, car, car 16 or uh, do what you can't see on the Um And then the, my second question was what, uh, in the lazy valuation version, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't quite follow that. By the way, when you say string, did you mean UTF 8 data? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't quite follow what's going on there. What is that returning to me? That's returning a, a container? It's just returning a range, uh, range adapter. Uh, it will adapt as a UTF-8 UTF data range so as into a, a decoded range. As it, as it iterates. Yeah, okay. Quite lazy. Yeah, yeah. But if you had to write as a type, this expression would be quite complicated. Yeah. Okay, um, so... Any, any question? I think that I think I have an I I I mean I thought about Unicode problems both from a boost standpoint from a standpoint of the standard library and I've also written Unicode stuff that's used commercially but I don't really know very much about Unicode. I don't have this kind, the kind of in-depth yeah, yeah. knowledge. They don't need to go very deep. Um, yeah. Uh, because as, yeah. as I said before, uh, so uh, whenever you go, when you try going into many character sequences, that's why it gets complicated because this means you can have a uh, different representation for the same for many character sequence. I mean, I, I did enough work with Unicode to have a vast respect for the U Unicode but standards. This, this, is not, this is not always needed because for most languages, right. uh, you already have pre-composed pre -composed forms. So you right. just need to normal, normalize right. it to NFC composed right. form, and just, you can just deal with it. But, right. um, I think that there are, it, it seemed to me that there is a level of user, but what what they want is a uh, UTF-8 underscore string, which is um, it, it, it's pretty much like what you're you were using yeah. standard string for, except that. It knows. Yeah, that. I think, I think a, a string type could be practical that does everything for you. That it always keeps a, a string in normalized form and everything. Right, but and it, you you make a you make a certain. But my problem was thinking about it that way, and is that then you do, you do it, and it, it's not too difficult to do uh, to design. But you realize very quickly that's great for a lot of situations, but. Blah, blah, it doesn't cover, and then all of the, the, the different types of range conversion and things like that. People are going to want that also. A, a different, a, a user who's in a little bit deeper. And, and I'm thinking that you could build 
that UTF-8, UTF-16, and those are the practical. I mean, you probably need UTF-32 and but. But yes, yes, it's just a no vote. So I didn't yeah. So, and, and then then there's um, and those those each one of those types has to be able to take any of the other common UTF types and probably others types, possibly with you providing some more, you know, type traits or. Yeah, but the UTF decode never yeah. really is that. So well, you've got that. You've got all yeah. those mechanisms there, and I think that. Yeah, it must be because the algorithms maybe I don't have the right design to make it usable. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm seeing that. I mean, just in this short overview, I have to use it, but it looked like a very nice design for the level that you're attacking at. And, but I'm just thinking to get a lot of user interest, you're going because I mean, a lot of people, the way they start using stuff is they use it at the really sort of high level, not too smart, and then they start realizing, they learn about it, and they say, oh yeah, I need this, and then they want to learn more and more and more. And if you've built a multi-level package, they can do that. Uh, I think there's actually a higher level where uh, somebody wants a, uh, a, a, what I thought of as a UTF string, that the internal encoding is unspecified, and that that can be maybe there maybe there's a uh, observer <coughs> and a uh, modifier function that can change the internal coding, but by default it just uses whatever it was constructed from, and and that's a, a slower, dumber, yet way of attacking the problem, but it's yet easier to use. Then you got all the problems with uh, have to be compatible with. A city string, QT string. Yes, yeah. I mean, you've got to eat. So what it comes what it comes down to is that you may have a non non templated, the actual string type UTF string may be non templated, but every function, or many many functions in it, are templated by what kind of a string type is the thing you're assigning or or the thing you're comparing. You know the. And, and likewise, the output functions are templated, and you say you want a string out, and you're going to have to specify what kind of a, a string it is. And I, or it I, uses type erasure, and then you don't need yeah. to have well, you know, all the input functions. Sure. Any, any range? Um, sure, but what I'm wondering is that, uh, or, or just my impression is that you do need those multiple levels. The, the, Dumb but easy level, and you know, not dumb isn't the right word. The the the, the solves a number of the more basic use cases, and then one, a level, maybe a second level that gets a little deeper, and then we come down to the the, the power that's under the hood to be able to address a vast range of Unicode problems. <clears throat> yes. Um, while I while I agree that that, that library is needed, uh, I also don't think we know exactly what the interface for that library is yet. Uh, I would really really like to accept something like this into Boost, so that people can go off and start start writing their own little abstraction that they're using to solve those problems conveniently in their application based on this, and we will see out of that should emerge what designs make sense. Yeah. You, you need to, before you start building a generic library, you need to look at use cases. And you need to look at, at concrete solutions to the problem. And we don't have enough, enough of a view of concrete solutions to the Unicode string problem well, to do that. Is, I, I don't think there's much of a unique problem. It's also, you have text, and you have to decide what you want to do with it. Yeah, I, well, no, I, Dave, Dave, Dave I, you can say graph, graph theory is like that. You have graphs, and you have to decide what you want to do with them. I don't <laughs> 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 there are some real graph problems, because uh, that maps to real big problems, but uh, for text it's, and all it's, a, it's not a question of, of algorithmic problems. It's a question of design problem. What kind of an interface is going to make people's lives easy and at the same time not introduce the kind of inflexibility or or uh, conceptual brokenness 
or whatever else that comes along when you try to try to take that design and apply it more widely. Those kinds of things, you, you can find out those things by looking at examples of what people actually do to solve their specific needs. Yes? I, I want to agree with Dave that as far as Boost is concerned, I think it's fine to, to bring this level library in and not, I would certainly wouldn't want it to be held up waiting for higher level abstractions on top of it. But I'm, I'm, what I'm still trying to grasp is, I know it covers very low level, or it appears to, and a little bit up, somewhat up from there, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how far up from there, and I'm, I'm curious about that, but it doesn't, whatever the answer is, it doesn't change my view of whether or not to accept the boost. Well, the thing I'm mostly concerned about is the wall, uh Reverse design, uh, which is the library is based on all the uh, basic the library is based on basically this concept uh, that says oh you perform conversion. I don't know if this is good enough. Uh, I've, I've used it for things other than Unicode. Can you be used for base sixty four encoding or decoding? So you can do base sixty four encoding decoding on the fly as with your data. You can also do it as we can't conversion based it to do it uh, for uh, SDF stream. But I, I don't know if this is quite good enough. Um, I would really like to have some feedback on this. Maybe people know uh, what iterators are. Because basically, what I do to evaluate step by step is that I, uh, I make a buffer which is aligned with the alignment of size uh, of type, put the type, of size max input. And the iterator adapter just calls step once. It, as you iterate, it consumes a synchron buffer, and then when the buffer is empty, it calls again to the converter to get the next step. And so you can go, go right, left to right, or right to left to the, to the string. But it could have been better to do it maybe with a coroutine. Um, so you would have the, the algorithm, the full algorithm, uh, that should yield each value. And this way, uh, you could, using coroutine, you can convert a generator into an iterator. Right. But I don't know if uh, this is really a good idea. Well, so this brings up an another thing that I was going to mention. I think I might mention this on the list, which is um, these are fundamentally uh, segmented hierarchical data structures you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And there's been a bunch of research into how to deal with that. Um, not, a, I wouldn't say a whole lot, but there's there's a paper that Matt Ostrom wrote. Have you read that? Uh, yeah, okay. but I don't see what and hier hierarchical algorithms, that one. Mm -hmm. um, so that, clearly that was written in a world where cover teams don't exist, right? Um, you can do the same kind of thing much sort of more expressively with a cover team more, more easily. You don't have to disentangle quite, quite so much stuff. Um, but, uh, so, but coroutines also require non-standard language exceptions, right? The problem with the coroutines, they need to handle the, the memory the coroutine is going to use, going to, just when you create the, the context and everything. There's allocation, but also, but also you need non-standard facilities. Yeah, you, 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 need, you need to, yeah. Well, right. you, could, you can do it with, uh, I think, um, set, jump, set jump and long jump, so that's mostly standard. Well, set jump no, no, it's undefined behavior if you set jump if you long jump over a, a um, you know the different structure. So it's so, yeah. so you can't do that. In but we, we do have a boost code in library. Yeah. So you know, I mean, if we can make it work, that's really cool. And then then we have to start asking ourselves whether the, our, the interface to this sort of thing ought to be constrained by um, you know the limits of uh, what you can do in standard C plus plus or or not. I'm not sure what the answer to that is yet. How portable is the coroutine library? Sorry? How portable is the coroutine library? Uh, I'm not sure. I think, it's, I think it was the only implementation is in assembly for x86, so not very portable. Um, is, 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 is 
that just an implementation technique or does it affect the interface, the public interface? Well, it says when you want to extend the system, uh, when you want to define a new converter, you define new systems and you have, you, the you have the, Okay, you don't just define a function and it's up to the system. <coughs> so when, when you want to define the UTF-8 uh, decoder, you define a converter like this, which uh, as input takes a car, as input uh, gives a car 32, uh, max output is uh, 1, and so you beat up to uh, 4 characters mm -hmm. in generate 1. But you, you could, we could do it simply, yeah. As a yeah, I mean, you you can implement that multiple. You know. Because um, there is uh, there are, there are already uh, iterator adapters which are in boost. Uh, they're in the details, I think, of of boost regex actually. And the, my my iterations are very very similar to the one boost regex, basically the same thing, except I've taken out all the decoding logic uh, out of the iterator adap adapter and I put it into a concept, and I can uh, reconstruct. And it's also adapter from uh, any model of this concept. Well, so I think Beeman's question about w whether it's an implementation detail or not sort of <coughs> sort of hits it at part of the heart of it. If we don't have if we don't have reasonable assurance of portability of you know that there can be a portable coroutine library on every platform, then you at least have to seems to me provide the other interface, the interface that doesn't depend on that. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you also provide an interface that you can take advantage of when you have coroutines, that might be that might be really cool. Um, well, yeah, you can evaluate this with the coroutine. It's just it's just eco evaluation with a different output iterator to evaluate with the coroutine. Okay, so are you are you saying that the use of the coroutine is an implementation detail? It's, it's possible with this concept. You can evaluate this concept using a coroutine or lazy uh, iterator. So then, what are you unsure about? It sounds like you, it sounds like you've got a great design, and you can, when you have coroutines available, you can use them. Uh, because, yeah, because the iterator adapter that applies this, this converter is not very pretty. It does a lot of tests, and it's expensive to flatten yeah. out the. The lazy evaluation is quite uh, quite more expensive. Than right. More. So this is where you might you might also consider doing the the hierarchical algorithm approach um, because that's what you know that's how you save doing a lot of extra tests mm. it's you know the same it's the classic iterating over a deck problem at every if you're you've yeah. got this flattened view of this hierarchical data structure at every step you have to check whether you're at the end of the segment um, and you also have to check whether you need to pop it in the next segment or something like that Makes it very expensive. Yeah, it's a very common problem. But the, uh, the problem is that it's not, never been integrated into anything. I don't think there is a boost range to support any kind of segmented iterator. So. Yeah, but it's a pure extension of, of the existing iterator. Yeah, iterator. because you have to provide both uh, the legacy as well the legacy iterator, right? You have to you provide two, two, two kinds of iterator. No. no, you provide one kind of iterator that can, that can either act as a legacy iterator mm -hmm. or can expose its segments. And and you have to write algorithms that know how to cope with that if you want to take advantage of the extra speed. But if you write algorithms that, that think all of your sequences are flat, they'll still work. So the nice thing about that is that you could start providing segmented algorithms and segmented iterators, and those two things would work together quickly. And you know it's kind of a smooth degradation of, of performance. Uh, but yeah, as a both, both so you use uh, whichever you can. Sorry. So you would have both, so you, you use whichever you can, because I know a lot of code. Uh, these will be iterators, and simply very hard to port it to use the iterators. Yes, and and they, they would just use the flat inter iterator interface and get as best performance as they could, but then they can be optimized. Yes. Have you looked at um, class path in uh, Boost Prowl System version three? Uh, specifically the, the, the conversion stuff that goes on there between UTF-8 and UTF-7. No, it, it's... The, the abstraction there is that a path is just a path, and that that is going to be on uh, Windows, it is going to be... It, it's. Platform dependent, what it is yeah, so you in, white internally, yeah, on on 
It's wide characters on, NT, on um, Windows. Mm -hmm. It's char on so the it's and it's not a templated class anymore. It's just a single type. So the the and then there are you know all the, all the in the constructors and everything like that are templated and will convert and then it has to have its own converters and it's terrible in the sense that. Um, uh, so what do you convert on, on POSIX systems? Do you convert to UTF-8 eight, or do you convert to the, the, the local? Well, it, there's a, there, it depends on the, um, if the input is a string, it's going to go, it's just passed through yeah. unmodified, because that's the POSIX spec for that sort of thing, and any other behavior would be very unspecified. If the input is UTF-16, for example, or any other, anything except just plain char, then it goes through a code convert facet, and I, I, you know, I ran into the exact same stuff you were talking about. Code convert's just awful, but it is the standard way of doing conversions, and I didn't, I, I didn't feel I could tackle any more than, you know, I didn't want to bite off more than I absolutely needed to. So I said, you've got to, you know, you provide this little conversion thing that is just a call or two. No, it's, it's, it's a code convert facet, basically. But I'd love to take some, and that would have been so much better if there was some string types, you know, UTF-8, UTF-16 sort of string types, and I didn't have to provide the mechanisms. That there yeah, was but the you, standard you have to make a decision of what the string type is going to be. People might not be able to. That's well, I know, no, no, the, the, the implementation, you know, the string type yeah, it's not, it's internally For my system stuff, you just use a, a, a something for the, that matches the system. Yes, it just matches the system. Mm -hmm. And that's the internal string type. The external types are whatever the user wants. You know, it's got to meet certain characteristics, and it's usually going to be char or wide char, or as we get into OX, you know, char 16 or char 32, but there's no reasoning principle, and I, I don't think in practice either, why it couldn't be, you know, just a completely different string type. In, in the path class itself is, is having to provide a great deal of machinery, probably not doing as good a job as a, a library like this that, that I could have at the least, I could have used it to construct all my conversion machinery and not, not, not had to roll my own, and that would have been better. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it'd be very interesting to try to apply it to that. Dave? Um, so the, the, the strings that are out there in the world, the string classes, you know, so you say you don't want to have to have to choose for people what string class they should use. It's very reasonable. Lots of lots of code out there using existing string classes. Those classes are those typically is the the encoding encoded into the type, or typically are they like STD string where the where you could put any encoding in there as long as it you know encodes into eight bit. Oh, uh, I think there is both. Okay, so you've got both kinds. Yeah. So I mean, for the ones where the encoding is tied, it's pretty. It's reasonably easy to, you know, build a, you know, the equivalent, the performance <coughs> concept maps or whatever, such that you, you're able to generically deal with them, uh, and know what encoding they are. The other ones, clearly not. Right? Clearly, when somebody gives you one of those, they, you have that to, they, don't know they have to tell you what it means. So, so I think you can solve. I think you can easily solve part of the problem. The other part, I'm not, I'm not quite as sure about. I mean, you know, if you could, if you could imagine templatizing the entire library on, a, on some policies that say, you know, this type is encoded as UTF-8, and this type is encoded as UTF-16, then you could, then you, you just be tag rent basically. Huh? You just be tagging the ranges with the encoding. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm back up at the level of 
of people who want to deal with, with strings mm -hmm. as opposed to ranges. Um, but that, that's the level at which I was thinking. But yeah, I guess I guess you can use a tag range, sure. The, the question is, at what level do you ask people? So, for example, <clears throat> if, if I'm writing a program and I'm using a, a string type that doesn't encode its encoding in the type, but but I may have a protocol basically where it's always UTF-8, right? I mean that's what I that's what I do. So it would be good to get a hold of a of a converter object that encoded the knowledge that this type is always UTF-8, and then I could reuse this thing over and over again. You know, some easy way to get that, <clears throat> um, and not have to rename the whole the whole thing and and you know not have to specify the whole mapping of that type into the into its encoding. You know, so so maybe I could declare an object, right? That maybe it's an empty object, so it, static initialization takes care of everything and and you know I brace initialize it. And now I have the converter for for this kind of uh, set of relationships between types and encodings. That yeah, baked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that's so. What, what what we're saying is that first is this level where nothing's baked in. One one level up are things like uh, converters where you bake in knowledge of one of the types. You know, or you bake in the knowledge of a type. Then the next level above that are stringy things where you bake in the knowledge. And that each of those have important, each of those levels have important users and use cases. I think that's probably right. I mean, the, you know, once you, once you start converting things into an object of a different type because of the way C++ is, and especially in 03, you're going to pay for a copy. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared for that if you're starting to deal with these stringy things. Um, but um, but that, that sort of gives you a spectrum of levels at which you can deal with the, the library without dictating too much, I think. If you, if you want to look at details after the class, I could like, you know, write some stuff down with you okay. if you think it'll help. Yeah, well, I did this, this library two years ago, and basically I don't really know what to do with it, because I don't know if, if it's good enough for, for, uh, for what we need in Boost. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's review watching, basically. So. Does, it, does it contain all of the sort of massive table information that, that is encoded into things like, uh, you know, the big unified library that's out there? Uh, I, I generally make yeah, a unicode character database. Um, I don't have all properties in it. I don't do any all things related to collation, sorting. You know, Dave, I Dave, the source of a lot of the tables is available from the Unicode Consortium. So, well, I, I know. I'm just asking. Okay. I'm just. I, I'm what, trying to. He's at, He's. A, he's not sure whether the library is worthy for boost, and I'm yeah. trying to sort of figure out how how extensive is it. What was it leaving out? So you're telling me now. Um, so there are some things that it leaves out. And does it need more features, or does it need to be polished on some of the same? How about the doc? And, and also, what is the state of the documentation? Is it, is it useful? Do you use it? Well, I only do uh, high performance computing, so I don't really use much. You only do what? Computing? High performance computing. I'm sorry. Uh, HPC. High performance. High performance. Oh, HPC. Okay. Um, so I don't use much text. Uh, does anybody use it? Uh, Do you have users? Not really, because I think it's not really practical to get it on the support the sandbox and set it up running. Because you need to build everything in the library. And, uh, think, uh, generally, I think it's quite hard for a library in the sandbox to be using. Okay, all right, I see that. Um, but I don't, I don't have any uh, user I'm aware of. I'm trying to remember, isn't there in one of the detail sections of some of the libraries something very similar? Yeah. In the details of uh, regex, there is a there are some similar uh, parts. It's try to adapt to that do on the fly UTF eight UTF sixteen conversion. Yeah. 
It's quite similar to what I have. Listen, the, um, um, the Unicode data, mm -hmm. referred to as a database, um, how is that physically incorporated into the library? It's a shared, ob shared object on GitHub. On what? It's it's a shared, DLL. DLL. shared object, DLL. Oh. So anyone who uses this library has to have that. Yeah, you, you need to link it. What's that? You need to link it, yeah. yeah. I don't remember what big it is, since maybe 500 kilobytes. But it's, it's static data, so there only needs to be one on the system. Mm -hmm. You can link it to static data, yeah, so, but... Yeah, you could. But, um, uh, I thought it was better to have a shared object, because since it's five, well, 500 is in that big, actually, but I thought it would be bigger, so I didn't want to duplicate it too much. I, I think, you know, if, if what you're looking for is, is is it ready for for boost? I think the the main criterion is going to be: Does somebody want it? Does somebody want this interface? And so far, I and you know, I, don't, I don't think there's anyone because um, very often when I ask for feedback, I don't get any feedback. So I don't really know what's wrong with it. So maybe someone can tell me. Okay. Yes. Just, just sitting here looking, you know, thinking about the use cases we have. You know, we have kind of a home base solution that uses Uniscribe and some other stuff and that range based iteration would be really simple to go to the beginning or end of the graph theme for example. So I mean I can see concrete use cases. Um, I guess I just have to pull it out and compile it and see if it works. Yeah. Yeah I, I for one want this library as is. I think it would be nice if there were some convenient functions on top, but I would use the shit out of this if you put it in for this. Yeah I think mm -hmm. that this is this should be this is exactly the kind of thing that, that the list needs more submissions of this this variety. Mm -hmm. Have a volunteer for a review manager. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and about um, uh, the database, you only need it if you actually use features that require it. You don't need to use database if you're just doing UTF transcoding. You need it for everything based on uh, graphemes, normalization. You know. would, would that say that's nice. Would that same information be available, like the code pages that Windows provides, for example? Yeah, I mean, you would have to write a, 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 I've been trying to make a, an ABI as simple and like a, as simple as possible, so that you could easily replace the library by, by another implementation. Mm -hmm. So you could be able to write a new implementation that uh, takes the values from, from Windows. Yeah. What, um, is, to what extent has it been tested? Uh, a bit, but not greatly. Uh, With multiple compilers? Uh, yes. And, and it, do, the, do the test cases in, uh, provide pretty good coverage of the library, or do you think that, you know, uh, what do you I, think? I, I think they're quite insufficient at the moment. I think they're quite insufficient to the test, the test, the test, the test, the The more and more examples than you need to test, really. Okay. They, they test all features, but they don't test with all possible data you could have. Yeah. So here's a nuts and bolts question. If you're, you say nobody's using it, how good is the test coverage over the library? Does it have good unit test coverage? Or? No, that's what he's yeah. saying. They're basically <laughs> example level coverage. Oh, okay. Not. So there is no real unit test coverage. Yeah. So Boost today has dependency on ICU. Is it possible to replace that dependency with this? Uh, it would be possible. It doesn't do as, as many things as like ICU, but. Uh, you would use that instead of ICU. Because we don't use all of ICU and Boost? That, that <coughs> well, that, that might be a good place to start, is to, have, is to, is to do that replacement, make sure that everything is, is covered. Oh, yeah. That's when you're I would like that to be confirmed or denied, though. Did, are, you saying, are you saying we can replace our use of ICU? I, I don't really know what ICU is used for. Uh, so it's used in Reg now. So we can't necessarily replace ICU and Boost with this because we don't know if we're using features from ICU that you're not supplying. Is that right? Yeah, but I, I don't know what RegEx uses ICU for. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so we don't, can we don't know that we can replace but, um, ICU with this. That, right. Is that true or not? I just want to... Yeah, I, I don't okay. know. I have to okay, say, we don't uh, know. Right. But uh, the, 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 the correct database provides all properties, so this probably covers all the needs you might need for RegEx. Okay, we're not sure, but probably. Possibly. Okay. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Yeah, and I looked at this for Spirit as well, uh, because um, I wanted uh, Spirit to 
uh, use my library if, if possible, because there was some uh, Unicode stuff was going on. But unfortunately, uh, since George Guzman, I didn't really like having a big uh, binary uh, as a library for the database, like that, having everything into a new file. So right. he said, no, you'd rather not use it. But I don't really agree with that. Well, I, I don't want to have to pull in a binary when I have a header only parser. That'd be why. But then again, do you expect to be able to deal with all kinds of Unicode with a header only? No, but for my use, I don't have to do Unicode. I can do right. Network IO. Right, with so Spirit we, now. So, you know, clearly Spirit could use this when you need Unicode, but you, you wouldn't want to impose it on every user of Spirit. Yeah. So you'll be able to match uh, certain types of characters, check that you have your own graphing boundary. Do what? It would be, could be used to check that uh, characters have certain properties, uh, more than unknown and alpha, things more advanced. And uh, you could, that character also lines the right boundaries when you match them. Mm -hmm. There could be interesting uses, but it's mostly extra stuff. Okay. Well, thank you. At least I got some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> First time you do. Certainly an interesting presentation, at the very least, and the library seems very interesting. Well, I'm not very good at making presentations, nor I'm speaking English, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you, you manage to understand, it's good enough. Yes.